Hi! Welcome back to my channel. It's 3.42 on a Friday, and tomorrow I'm turning 24. And 365 days ago, I said to you something along the lines of, I'm going to read Coriolanus, it's going to be a great fucking time, and then I'm going to talk to you about it, and then I didn't read it for six months, but in January, and eight months later, I am talking to you about it. So this is going to be really messy, because I have to try to remember things about Coriolanus, which I read eight months ago. I made all these notes. Look at them. So I made all these notes because I care about Coriolanus so much. So Coriolanus was a potentially real historical figure, and he was a Roman general at the very beginning of the Roman Republic, like within the first 25 years or something. He was a Roman general who fought the Volscians, who came from the land of Antium. I don't know a lot about it. That's the information that I received from the play. Not really that important. I guess it could be. He, single-handedly, according to legend, defeated an entire city single-handedly. The city he defeated was Coriolis, and he took the surname, the cognomen, Coriolanus. So Coriolanus is about this historical legend figure, Caius Martius Coriolanus, and he's a Roman general, and he, after his defeat of Coriolis, he gets the name Coriolanus, and he becomes, well, he is asked to become consul. The Roman Republic was a republic. Like all republics and all democracies, there were some issues. There was corruption, there was voter suppression, there was the problem what happens when you ask every single person their opinion and some of those people are easy to manipulate and sometimes they're easier to manipulate in crowds and there was also senatorial bloat hello it's editing anna this play is not about senatorial bloat at all and i hope that i have um properly cut out all of the things about senatorial bloat in this play because it's not what it's about but i want you to know i care about roman senatorial bloat it's something i've decided to devote my life to caring about that's legitimately true okay sorry in the days of the republic and in the days of the empire there were two social classes in rome well two major ones and they were the patricians and the plebeians the patricians were a noble class and they came from the original ruling families of rome and then there were the ple plebeians which was everybody else and obviously the plebeians is a much larger class. You got two consuls, both typically military leaders, and they were advised by the Senate, and they were advised by the tribunes. The tribunes were supposed to speak for the plebeians. At the time of Coriolanus, there was a grain crisis that was not related to what is actually happening in this play, but the grain crisis is kind of part of this, although very easily easy to be ignored. The, this play, it's a doozy. The most interesting thing that I found doing like a little bit of background reading, literally just searching on Wikipedia, was that historically Coriolanus got into trouble when he very vocally wanted to take away the position of the tribunes. So there are two villains, I think they're villains, and their names are Sicinius and Brutus, they are tribunes. They are two tribunes, represent the people, but they also manipulate the people. I think that there are really generous readings of these characters where they genuinely want to look out for the people's interests and they really feel that Coriolanus is a bad guy who will trample all over their rights. Or a really ungenerous reading of these characters where they are terrified that Coriolanus is going to take away their power will do whatever they have to to stop that from happening. Because Coriolanus got into a big huff, the trouble he got into was directly related to taking away the power from the people. Like the plebeians had this political movement and they were able to get representation in the Republic, but the governing structure that they basically came to an agreement on was to have to, tri to have tribunes to represent them and what Coriolanus really wanted to do was to take away the pa the position of tribune so I think like to me a really good reading of what's happening is like they know that publicly that he's publicly like been against their having any sort of political power and they would like to maintain their political power so this is a play that is often used for political propaganda so much of it can be staged or read in a way that can be in 
serious support of any kind of like political power that you want to support. And I think it makes it a seriously potentially dangerous play. It has caused civil unrest and riots. Uh, for me, I think it's more about like the vanity of people in power and how they really think that they're more like gods than people. So I didn't totally explain this like very well, but what was happening 400 BC, 425 BC, I think is technically when this play would take place. I think that's when Coriolanus historically may have lived that there had been a grain crisis and the plebeians seceded. I think this was all happening around the same time. I read a Wikipedia page on it and they had seceded from Rome and they demanded certain representations in the Senate, not in the Senate, but in the government. And the agreement that they came to was to have tribunes represent them. Um, so they would, so the tribunes would work with the Senate and they would advise the consuls. Coriolanus had been at the time very vocally against this. Historically, what happened is that after he became consul or he was put up to become consul, he was charged with treason and he refused to go to his own trial. And so he was banished and then the rest of the events of the play take place more or less. Um, so I didn't do a really good job explaining like the like, what was happening in this friggin' play. So that was, that's the explanation. And like, let's go. Like, let's just look at some text, please. Well, there is a growing conflict with the Volscians and Marcius right out of the gate says, we shall have means to vent our musty super superflu superfluity. I cannot speak. At this point, we're 200 lines into the play. He's already insulted the people of Rome and he's excited for war. But to me, this line really shows that Martius is not only a man whose values don't align with those of the people, but uh, while the people are worried about a grain crisis, not having enough food, Martius thinks they're lazy, they're foolish, they're incompetent, that they have so much at their disposal that they that they need a war to get rid of some of the laziness of the people and he delivers this beautiful speech before he says the thing about war so they'll sit by the fire and presume to know what's done in the capital who's like to rise who thrives and who declines side factions and give out Conjectural marriages making parties strong, feeling such as stand not in their liking, blow their cobbled shoes. They say there's grain enough. Will the nobility lay aside their ruth and let me use my sword. I'd make a quarry with a, with thousands of these quartered slaves as high as I could pluck, pick my lance. I think fundamentally he believes that because the people, the plebeian class doesn't necessarily come and fight in the wars that he's putting his life on the line for, he feels like they don't have the same kind of say don't understand like all of the things that make the world go around he's you know Martius is a character who could be the villain of his own play he repeatedly assault ins he doesn't assault insults and harasses the people who are being manipulated on all sides they're not really being manipulated by Coriolanus but they are certainly not being dealt with honorably by the rest of the nobility besides the tribunes. At best, he is a condescending and out of touch member of the ruling class, but at worst, he is evil and greedy and violent. Loud. On the other hand, I do think that the mob in this play does do what mobs tend to do. They turn on Martius with the least amount of provocation. They could, this could as easily become a play about the need for a strong central monarch or government. Scene three, and we are introduced to our only two female characters in this play who I love to pieces, and they are Bologna, who is Martius's mother, who I'm going to be talking most about, and Virgilia. Virgilia, Martius's wife. She is crying, she doesn't want to go out, she's waiting for Martius to return home from war. Bologna is chastising her for this. She gives the following speeches, which I'm just going to read. If my son were my husband, I should be I should freely rejoice in that absence wherein he won honor than in the embracements of his bed where he would show most love. Had I a dozen sons, each in my love alike, and none less dear than thine and my good Martius, I had rather eleven die nobly for their country than one voluptuously, voluptuously surf it uh, out of action. Blood more becomes man that guilt his trophy. The breast of Hecuba when she did suckle Hec Hector looked not lovelier than Hector's forehead when it spit forth blood at Grecian sword contending. Polumnia sees herself 
as Hecuba, probably more than she sees uh, Marge's as Hector. She thinks that there's a lot to be gained in war and battle and being this leader of men. He has lived up to all of her expectations and she has molded him and created him from her own womb into the kind of man who does charge into a city by himself and uh, kill all of their women. Virgilia, on the other hand, is another Penelope. She is spinning and staying at home and out of faithfulness to Martius as Penelope did for Odysseus, which I have to look up. I am a dumbass. But this is not seen as an act of love or an act of faithfulness in, to the other characters in this play, but rather a stupid and foolish thing that she's doing. She would be another Penelope. If they say all the yarn she spun in Ulysses' absence did fit, but fill Ithaca full of moths, come, I would your cambric were sent were as sensible as your fingers that you might leave perking it for pity so not only is her silence and her womanly womanly activities and her faithfulness to Martius the man and who is her husband and not Martius this public figure Martius this general leader of men insensible to them but even destructive, which I think the most interesting part of this is that she is the only character who seems to understand Martius. She doesn't, it's really hard to like kind of get a read on that, but uh, she's she's somebody who wants her husband home with her, who doesn't want there to be like, uh, she doesn't want him to die. She's the only one who's consistent with that throughout. And so when I first read Coriolanus, I thought like, I think this is a play that's primarily about like the public and the private. And I thought that because I watched the uh, Rafe, Rafe Fiennes and Gerard Butler movie version that came out like early 2000s. Jessica Chastain plays this character, Virgilia, and she is, you know, weepy and quiet, but she and Marcius have like this somehow like fleshed out relationship where they clearly love each other they clearly don't want any of what's happening to them to be happening and they just she just wants all of this to be over the other interesting thing about that movie is that i think i think it might take place in like a modern day italy and there is a similar like food shortage shortage uh famine thing going on and there is a group of insurgents and those are the volsians so they kind of are able to integrate those two aspects of this play a little bit better um, let us return to, well, return, but go for the first time for us, but return to the battlefield. And we can just read some of the things that Marcia says to his own soldier. He that retire, I'll take him for a Volshi. He shall feel mine edge. All the contagion of the South light on you, you shames of Rome. You heard of boils and plagues. Plaster you o'er that you may be abhorred farther than seen, and one inflect another against the wind a mile. You souls of geese that bear the shapes of men, how have you run from slaves that apes would beat? Pluto and hell, all hurt behind, backs red and faces pale with fight and agued fear, mend and charge home, or by the first fires of heaven I'll leave the foe and make my wars on you. Look to it, come on, if you'll stand fast we'll beat them to their wives as they to our trenches. But he's an interesting guy. He clearly has some issues. He is calling his own men cowards because they want to retreat and then he gets locked in to his... So the first thing this really establishes for me is like how passionate he is about making war. The other thing is that he's not particularly wrong. He could be seen as being not particularly loyal to his own people um, and being loyal to Rome as this concept as a, as a, to a kind of a fault. Really he's loyal to himself as we can see later. That he would do anything that his honor is not besmirched. And anyway, at the end of the scene, he gets locked in the walls of Coriolis and he, everybody thinks he's dead. They're like, damn, I think he's dead. Act one, scene eight, we've got a Martius and Ophidius, who is the leader of the Volscians. This is their first encounter in this play and uh, they, they beat the shit out of each other. In scene nine, Martius is revealed to be alive. He is injured, but he doesn't think his injuries are that bad. So he doesn't really want to be praised or rewarded for being injured. He um, delivers this concerning line. My mother who has a charter to extol her blood when she does praise me grieves me. <laughs> it's concerning to me because I think it's saying that the only time Volumnia would ever praise, um, really praise Coriolanus 
is who he hasn't even given that a name yet, but I'm going to start calling him that would be uh, when he is dead. She can only praise him when she is also grieving him. Cominius, who is another general, is like, dude, grow up. You single-handedly took down this one city, and uh, we are going to reward you for it. We're going to give you the name Coriolanus, and then we're going to make you consul. To act to enter villains who have already talked about, they're Brutus and Sicinius. Uh, they immediately call Martius the enemy of the people. Menenius characterizes the Publians as predators. So he's Martius's good friend. So, you know, maybe the tribunes have a point. And they have this, like, little exchange. So Kinius says, Nature teaches beasts to know their friends. Pray you who does the wolf love? The lamb? Aye, to devour him, as the hungry plebeians would noble Martius. He's a lamb indeed that bays like a bear. He's a bear indeed that lives like a lamb. They're having this uh, argument about, like, what Martius is nature is they also start to talk about Martius's or Coriolanus's like natural flaw. Like there are compelling readings of this where his main problem is that he has no idea what to do as a public figure and is a good man. He's a brave, committed man, honorable, noble, courageous, loyal, but he doesn't know, doesn't like to be anybody but himself and to be a public figure you do have to bow down a little bit. Menenaeus thinks that, you know, everybody in this room struggles with pride. Sicinius Brutus think that he's too proud to be a somebody who works for the people. Menenaeus says that it's some really something for them to be criticizing Martius's pride. Maybe they've looked at the mirror recently. Mama enters. Uh, she's very happy for Coriolanus's wound, when Virgilia hears about it, she weeps. But Volumnia is happy about the status of wound received in battle awards her son, while Virgilia is uh, still focused on the life and happiness of her husband, which is very different. Martius enters and he receives the name Coriolanus. He does not <laughs> want to talk about it anymore. He's like, thank you, but please stop. Please stop talking about it. It makes him really uncomfortable. And he says to his mother, you have, I know, petitioned all the gods from my perspective my prosperity, just, you know, how much of a hand Volumnia really has in this, how much she really wants him to be consul for his status symbol is really something to think about, as in, like, how much it informs what happens next. Which is to say that I think that there is a correct reading, not just a compelling one, but a correct reading of this play where Volumnia, for better or worse, or for real reasons or fabricated ones takes a lot of responsibility for the things that happen after uh, Coriolanus decides that he does want to be consul. That she has been pushing him and molding him his whole life in order to be this valiant soldier who never can back down from a fight or from standing up for his own personhood uh, and being this very uh, stereotypical like roman man his name is martius i <laughs> i keep touching on it but i haven't said it but like martius is um is a name that for mars the god of war um so he's martial in character he uh, and so she's named him martius and she is molding him and encouraging him in certain ways and when it comes to the end of the play she is trying to renounce it it's kind of too late and i think that adds like an extra element of tragedy which uh is even more compelling than Martius. this is just like something intrinsic in him or is his own quality like uh by the end of the play Bologna is like oh fuck <laughs> so that's something i didn't explain i was extremely tired when i filmed this video and i do not want to re try to refilm the whole thing and then he says to Virgilium my gracious silence he calls her her silence it makes me feel crazy hail wouldst thou have laughed had i coffined home had i come coffined home that i that weep so to see me triumph ah my dear such eyes the widowed coral is where so he sees volumnia volumnia virgilia weeping and he's like girl i'm alive don't cry <laughs> and he doesn't think her reaction to him being injured is appropriate at all. This is both happy and humble in this scene. Mostly he's humble when he uh, is like, please, please stop talking about it. I just want to be with my family. I just want to like get my due, receive like 
and be with my family. He also has a son. I, ha I haven't mentioned him because he has no lives, but he has a son. Brutus and Zacchaeus are immediately wary and they admit to Coriolanus's new power, but the people are excited about uh, such a remarkable warrior coming home. That They're, they're ha happy about it. Brutus and Zacchaeus, the tribunes, they're not as happy. They believe that their power will disappear when Coriolanus takes power, and they believe that for historical reasons. They cast doubt on Martius's commitment to the people that they represent. Sicinian says, doubt not the, the commoners for whom we stand, but they upon their ancient notice will forget the least cause of these, these his new honors. They heard him, his swear, were he to stand for consul, never would he appear in a marketplace, nor on him put the hapless vesture of humility, nor showing, as the manner is, his wounds to the people, beg their stitching breasts. So, there's this custom, I don't know if it's historically accurate, but there's this custom to be made consul. You show up in the marketplace and you're like, hello, look at the wounds that I have received for my country. I have done this for you. Will you do this for me? Martius does do this part, but he doesn't want to show people his wounds. I think part of the reason he doesn't want to show people his wounds is because he really doesn't think that he is deserved this. He doesn't think his injuries are that bad. He'll be consul if everybody asks him to, but it's really nothing to him either way, and he feels kind of uncomfortable. Um, that's my really charitable reading of him. Like, there, Sicinius and Brutus definitely have a point. <laughs> he is not somebody who likes the people. He doesn't like them. He thinks that they are lazy and that they don't make the required sacrifices for prosperity in his country. Scene two. This is a scene between a bunch of officers talking about Coriolanus. They say that he seeks out the hate of the common people, um, which seems unlikely, but you know, Officer two says that Coriolanus has, on the other hand, made great sacrifices for Rome, and you would be an idiot to say otherwise. Honest is likely to be a consul, but he doesn't care for the people. The second officer says, Faith, there have been many great men that have flattered the people who never loved them. And Coriolanus doesn't do that. He At least he doesn't love the people, but he certainly doesn't flatter them. He's not being rewarded for his public manner um, or for his feelings for the people. He is being rewarded only, only for his bravery and his courage and his soldierly duties. <laughs> For his country and as a uh, consul is technically a military position it seems appropriate the second officer continues he hath deserved worthily of his country and his ascent is not by such easy degrees as those who having been supple and courteous to the people bonneted without any further deed to have them at all into their estimation and report but he has so planted his honors in their eyes and his actions in their hearts that for the tongues to be silent and not confess so much were a kind of ungrateful injury to report otherwise were a malice that giving itself he lie, he lie, would pluck reproof and rebuke from every ear that heard it. His actions, uh, defending Rome and being injured in the defense of Rome, make him worthy of running the country, and people know it, and there are lots of other people who have not earned the position of being consul or any other public office, and therefore it would be dishonorable to for them to give their voices to somebody else and not support Coriolanus. There's also this running theme of the body politic where they are like shown in literal body images early really early in the play in the very first like uh line menenius talks about the body body politic like actually and he talks about the stomach of the senate and the limbs of the plebeians so um i want to draw focus on this passage and not the one at the beginning because that one is insensible to me martius gives his literal body for the people but not his literal voice Marcius will prove himself to be incapable of giving his voice and later show that he is not really very devoted to the people in his body either. At this stage, the people have seen his honors, or they will see his honors, his injuries with their eyes. They have felt their, his actions in their hearts, and also they're still alive, so also in their bodies. It would be an injury to themselves, an injury to the body politic, if they lied about it and would injure all of them, if they... if like the, that started to get around basically. There's a senator talking to the tribunes and he says, masters of the people, we do re request your kindest ears after your loving motion toward the common body to yield what passes here. The tribunes are the voices and they're the ears of the people, um, which gives them a lot of power over the common body, <laughs> does it not? They are the masters, head, ears of the common body and they must act for it or they should and they cannot act, act against it or above it. 
but they certainly probably would in rea reality and probably do in this play. Lucius is the best man of action, of best of men in action alone, and he inspires the other, mostly nobility to also, but he can't bear to hear himself talked about. When they're talking about him, about his wounds and his sacrifices and how great he is, he leaves the room. He accepts the position of consul and promises his continued life and service to the Republic, but he does not want to speak to the people. He says, I do beseech you, let me overlap that custom, for I cannot put on the gown, stand naked, and entreat them for my wounds sake to give their suffrage. And Sicinius replies, sir, the people must have their voices, which is fair, but Coriolanus thinks this is like all stupid, like technically he's already been made consul, they just need to do this little ceremony thing and then the people will feel like they're being heard and i just i he part of it is like definitely like he feels like it's insulting to him like why should he have the masses like comment on his injured body but on the other hand like it's an insult to the people like it's a complete farce of an election Anna says to brag unto them thus i did and thus show them the unaching scars which i should hide as if i had received them for the higher of their breath only the wounds have healed and it feels wrong to be in a consul for something that no longer ails him, but he received them for the higher of the breath only. Oh my god, there's shame attached to this that he is has displayed real courage and real sacrifice. But it, it's not courage if you do it for <laughs> political power. He just did it because it's what he does. And he's and flaunting your injuries is a shameful thing. Two, scene three. We have power in ourselves to do it, says the citizen, but it is a power that we have no power to do for if he shows us his wounds and tells us his deeds we are to put our tongues into the wounds and speak for them so if he tells us his noble deeds we must also tell our noble acceptance of them and gratitude is monstrous and for the multitude to be ungrateful were to make a monster of the multitude and which we being members of which we of the which we are being members should bring ourselves to be monstrous members says if he would incline to the people there was never a worthier man Coriolanus says no it was never my desire yet to trouble the poor with begging and so Coriolanus enters he doesn't want to speak with the people beg them for his their vote but he's warned and he tells them that he is there because of his actions and he doesn't want to be the people are kind of clued into that this is kind of a farce of an election they don't really have a choice either way technically he's even already been made consul but they could still revoke it and they don't really have a choice about like whether or not he is it would just be completely obscene for them to pretend that he on be consul. Coriolanus does get the vote of this first group of people and also all the rest of the groups. There are three of them and they promise to show them the wounds in private if they would like to see them. Uh, they are a part of service to Coriolanus, not a ploy to get political power. A, to show them is the price of political power um, and also to ask the people. All they would like is to be asked. They challenge him on it, his love for them, but he's like, I'll just I'll do what you want. It doesn't matter to me. Like, I'm just here. I want to, I've always wanted to do my service to Rome and that this is part of it. I'm willing and able. Um, he says, better it is to die and better to starve than crave the hire which first we do deserve. Why in this wolvish togue should I stand here to beg of Hob and Dick that does appear? Their needless vouches, custom calls me to it. Let what custom wills and all things should do it. But Dust on antique time would lie unswept in mountainous air to be highly heaped. For truth to appear rather than fool it so, let the high office honor go and honor go to one that would do thus. Your voices, your for your voices I have fought, watched for your voices, for your voices bear wounds two dozen odd, battle thrice six I have seen and heard of. For your voices, then many things, some less, some more. Your voices. The begging works because it has to, but Coriolanus feels dirty. The people feel dirty. Everybody feels like they've been used in this situation. He makes it out alive. He's been made consul. He wants to change before he can be like officially sworn in. He leaves, he goes to change out of the robe of humility, which is what he wears before the people. He immediately gets mocked by the citizens, but they can't really do anything about him. They're like, maybe it's not a big deal. Citizen three, he's the guy who knows what's up, says, I thank you for your voices. Thank you. Your most sweet voices. Now you have left your voices. I have no further use, no further with you. Zacchaeus and Brutus, they walk in. They're like, Dan, do you hear him mock you? <laughs> 
And they're like, yes, we know he's mocking us. Like, what are you going to do about it? But it's our duty to accept. It's his duty to represent us, to do what we need and um, be our dude. And it's their duty to tell him that it's okay. And Brutus is like, now arriving a piece of potency and sway of the state, if he should still malignantly, if she should still malignantly remain fast foe to the pleb plebeiae, your voices might be curses to yourselves. He has worthy deeds to claim no less than what he stood for. So his gracious nature would think you will think upon you for your voices and translate his malice toward you into love, standing friendly lord. Did you perceive he did solicit in free contempt when he did need your loves? And do you think that his contempt shall not be bruising to you when he hath power to crush? Why, had your bodies no heart among you, or had your tongues to cry against the rectorship of judgment? So I read that in like a, like a shitty little tone, but like, uh, this could be a really empowering speech where you're like, they don't care. They just want your votes. Damn, we speak for you. They don't. And you can read that as like, the tribunes really do speak for for the people. Or you could read it as like, they do not speak for the people. They just want to make sure that Coriolanus doesn't take away their power. And both readings of them are valid. And both of them are really good. I think that these guys are full of shit, but... You know, I'm not, I'm not the whole, I'm not the whole body politic. They're like, Coriolanus, he fucking hates you. He was making fun of you while he was asking for you to make him consul. Think about what he's going to do when he doesn't need you anymore. He is going to hurt you. And you did that to your, them, yourself, you dumb bitches. And they get all riled up. They're like, take back your voice, take back your votes, take back your votes. Recant your, recant, recant your votes. Come on, do it, do it, you little, little fools. Um, they no, their votes no longer represent their feelings. That's, that's that, and that's that. So, okay, I'm gonna go. We have three and four and five to do. Three more acts, but I have to go to the store. So I'll see you later. Goodbye, um, for now. All right, it's like a vlog, but different because I already read it. Hello welcome back i mean it's not welcome back for you but it's welcome back for me where were we act act three Coriolanus and gentry enter enter and they are speaking about aphidius who is again the leader of the volscian army and Coriolanus wants to go after him and then sicanius and brutus enter Coriolanus says behold behold these are the tribunes of the people the tongues of the common mouth i do despise them for they do prank them in authority against all noble sufferance. I don't know what this is about. Is it playful? I don't remember. Haha, <laughs> stop. We may have turned people against you. That's what I wrote in my notes I wrote. Haha, <laughs> stop. They come in and they're like, just so you know, like, they don't want you to be consul anymore. The people. And Coriolanus says, and oh, and also they're out for blood. And so Coriolanus says, oh, you being, he doesn't say, oh, you being their mouths, why rule you not their teeth? Good question, Martius. Why rule them not their teeth? He believes correctly that the tribunes have turned the people against him on purpose. That if they wanted to, <laughs> since they speak for them, since they perhaps on purpose turned them against him, they should be like, well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna kill him and you have to relax. Just so we're all on the same page. All right, let me back up. Martius's assertion here, Coriolanus's assertion, is that the tribunes have turned the people against him and have the power, if they would love to, like to wield it, to call off the mob. But obviously they will never call off the mob because the mob benefits them. No, don't worry about it. That's, that's the reading of those lines. I shall not offer no commentary. Yes says the people are abused set on this paltering becomes not rome nor has coriolanus deserved the dishonored rub laid falsely in the plain way at his merit i think that's pretty clear if you do ask me and you are asking me uh Cominius is you know he's one of coriolanus's class i think that Cor coriolanus Cominius kind of can see what's going on here he thinks that Coriolanus Martius is a little abrasive, maybe, but Sicinius and Brutus have stirred up the plebeian class and uh, are being manipulated into taking a well-earned position away from, uh, from Martius. And not only like the position away from him, but also he just is straight up like, maybe we should kill him. Before I continue, right, past me, 
20, stupid 23-year-old me continues. Coriolanus makes a comment before Comenius delivers these lines, which is like, have I been voted for by children? I think that that, that that gives a little bit more context to the original lines that I had picked out, because not only does Comenius understand like the full scope of what the tribunes are doing, I, he doesn't Coriolanus is like, what the fuck is going on? Of course, they were the people have been manipulated. They're just common people. Cominius is not somebody who, who he's somebody who thinks who thinks highly of Rome, for the whole play. Like uh, after this interaction, perhaps Martius's feelings about the Rome about Rome and the Roman people. Uh, they'll be changed. Cominius is looking at this. Uh, Martius is looking at the situation, and he's like, what the fuck is going on? And how could you do this to me? Can you not control the mob? And Cominius's reaction to this is not, can you not control the mob, but you oughtn't to treat the people of Rome like this, not to Martius, but to uh, Sicinius and Brutus. You are meant to represent them. You are not meant to manipulate them. You are, and, and rile them up into a mob that the people of Rome don't act like this. They don't act like children who's, who change their minds and who throw a tantrum and things get a little hairy. They're men, not babies. And that's something I missed. <laughs> that's actually pretty important because I think it speaks to the character of Rome and to the character of these people and that uh, the, the, the tribunes who are meant to be looking out for the, the working class but like the, the people of Rome are, are as much part of the ruling class and as liable to liable to manipulate them for the sake of maintaining and gaining power. I just like, no commentary, simply analysis. Everyone's is getting like riled up. I mean like, have you ever gone in for a job interview and then you got it, but then you got a call and they're like, never mind, like we're gonna kill you instead. Everyone is, says, all right, it's soothing them, it's soothing them. In soothing them, in soothing them, we nourish against our Senate the cockle of rebellion insolence and sedition. At this point, Martius is starting to kind of act like he thinks he's God, that he can do whatever he wants, that he is now in charge of Rome, so no rebellion on his watch. They're like, you, you gotta, you gotta be quiet. Like, let the grown-ups handle the situation, and then you can just be consul later, like, when the rebellion dies down. And he's like, they're like, you're not God. And he's like, I am. And I would die for these people, and they should not kill me for it. Talk about how the downfall of Athens is democracy. There's a lot of stuff happening here. We don't need to get into it. I'm deciding. So there's a lot of shit happening. It's getting messy. They're having an argument. The people are at the door. They're coming for him. He wants, he's going to be killed. They're like, just step down. And he's like, no, historically, Coriolanus just didn't show up for his trial. They were like, we're going to kill you. And he was like, no, fuck you. And he just like didn't show up for his trial. Coriolanus says, I'll give my reasons more worthier than their voices. He's saying all sorts of like bad, <laughs> he's saying all sorts of bad shit about the plebeians. And so uh, the uh, Brutus is like, well, why would they want you to speak for them? And he's like, I'll give my reasons more worthier than their voices. Like I'm better, I'm better suited to be consul and be the voice of the <laughs> the people better than the pe voices of the people you dumb hoes okay they know the corn <laughs> was not recompensed resting well assured they ne'er did service for it being pressed to the war even when the navel of the state was touched they would not thread the gates this kind of service did not deserve corn gratis so remember we've got a grain crisis going on. The people are hungry. The Senate seems to be being fed, and the the people who, in theory, make Rome go, 
are not, this is sad. I don't think people should be hu going hungry. But Coriolanus is like, if these people want to be fed, they could join the army. Like me, I'm in the army. I would risk my life and I have, and I was injured and I defeated an entire city. Do you remember how I defeated an entire city? That's what this whole play is based on, how I defeated one city by myself, all alone, me, Coriolanus. Caius Martius Coriolanus. And that's how I got this name, Coriolanus. They would love to eat but they would not like to work for their corn and they think that they can they deserve corn by just being alive he's like i don't deserve corn for just being alive who here doesn't do work being in the war their mutinies and revolts wherein they showed most valor spoke not for them the, the accusation which they have often made against the Senate, all cause unborn, could never be the native of our so frank donation. Of course, there are um, accusations in the Senate, which is, I think they make it in the first act, in the first scene, uh, is that the Senate is taking more than their fair share of corn. This is a tale as old as time. But Coriolanus is saying it is not true at all. Obviously, it's not true at all. Well, what then? How has this bosom multiplied digest the Senate's courtesy? Let deeds express what it's like to bear their words. I I love a character who's like all action, who's like action motivated, like uh, doesn't, can't express himself, doesn't know how to use words, and doesn't think words are very valuable. He's all actions. He does use words to like do violence. I think that's pretty cool. But he he's like... They've done nothing to prove to me that they even want to, they even care about Rome. They, they, they don't defend their homes. I defend their homes and they don't, they elect the consul and they're like, eh, never mind. I don't care. Like, <laughs> whatever. What's it, let deeds express what it, what's like to be their words. We did request this. We did request it, we are the greater pull, and in true fear they gave us our demands. Thus we debase the nature of our seats and make the rabble care, cough our cares fears, which will in time break up the locks, locks of the Senate and bring in the crows to peck the eagles. So Coriolanus is like, if we capitulate to the masses, to the mob, then they will think that the only reason that we do anything for them is because we are afraid of them. And he's like, I'm not a coward, and I care about Rome. At this point, I think he does. Like, I think he means it. And uh, why this is Menenius is trying to be like, calm down. Uh, Brutus is like, dude, <laughs> relax. Like, you don't have to insult them when they're mad at you for insulting them. It doesn't look good. Um, but you know, they're they're getting all riled up, and then the rabble enters. And they come in with soldiers, and they're like, they're gonna arrest Coriolanus. Brutus is like, Marcius is worthy of present death. Sicinius and Brutus both bring Coriolanus in a traitor, and then the only pen punishment for him is, uh, at this point, death, which is crazy. Like, he hasn't done anything. He didn't do anything between them wanting him to be consul and him wanting to be um, not consul, and now they're calling for his death. So I, I do think, like, in some ways, like, it's there's sympathetic readings of both parties but i really don't know how many sympathetic readings there are of these two characters you're like maybe Coriolanus should be killed he didn't do anything between the time that you thought you wanted him to be consul and the time that you changed your mind but what if we killed him menenius makes a tries to uh defend Coriolanus, and he says his heart his heart's his mouth he thinks with his heart but he doesn't just he just says what's on his mind or what's in his heart and he doesn't doesn't he's not thinking he's just saying shit like, you know he's just one of those guys who just says shit and so his heart's his mouth what his breast forges his tongue must bend and being angry does forget that even heard the name of death so he's like getting all right out there like we should kill you and he's like nah fuck you <laughs> You can't kill me. Menenius, he's concerned about revolution. He's like, you know, uh, Coriolanus is like left the building, I guess. I really don't know. He's like, Coriolanus is not a disease. He is a limb that has but a disease. Mortal to cut it off. To cure it easy. He's like, 
we're all just tensions are high <laughs> we need to relax if i go talk to coriolanus everything will be fine what has he done to rome that's worthy death killing our enemies the blood he has lost which i dare vouch is more than that he hath by a many an ounce he dropped it for his country, and what is left to lose it by his country were to us all that do it and suffer it a brand to the end of the world. He is. What are his crimes? What are we charging him with? To be a page. <laughs> killing our enemies? Not a crime. I mean, killing people is not is a crime, but killing our enemies is not a crime. The blood he hath lost? He dropped it for his country. And by the way, he probably has lost more blood for this country than he has. That's crazy. That's so much blood. How is he still alive? What is left? What is left of his blood? Because you only get so much blood for your whole life. What is left of his blood to lose it by his country? Well, that would basically be the end of the world. That would be such a terrible dishonor. And you know what? I don't want to sympathize. Well, I, I'm already sympathizing with him, so I can't help it. But um, Coriolanus, he's gone. He's gone? I guess he's gone. Like, I guess he's been taken out of the room. He left the room. When did he leave the room? Coriolanus is talking to his mother. They're like begging him to go to his own trial. He's like, no, I don't want to go to my own trial. I haven't done anything wrong. I don't even, I shouldn't even be getting a trial. I don't, I don't even know what crimes I'm being accused of. Uh, Volumnia says, I have a heart as little apt as yours, but a brain that leads my use of anger to better vantage. We're all, we're all mad. And like when, when the two of us, when the two of us are mad, like that's it. Like that's all we're going to think about. That's all we're going to be able to do. We're not going to be able to settle this. But what if I use my mama brain and I said, you should go to your own trial. Valenia it urges him to apologize because it will save not only his life, but it will stop revolution. Revolution should be avoided at all costs. She says, my praises made the first a soldier, so to have my praise for this perform a part thou hast not done before. This will be the first time. Oh God. This will be the first time that Valenia asks Coriolanus to do something that's kind of against his nature, and this time it does not succeed. He's got a soldier spirit, but anything else is a lie and a sellout, and he feels like dirty trying to pretending to be somebody he's not and he says away my disposition and possess me possess me some harlot spirit <laughs> my throat of war be turned was quired with my drum into a pipe small as eunuch or the virgin voice that babies lull to sleep the smiles of knaves tent in my cheeks and a schoolboy's tears make the glasses of my sight a beggar's tongue makes motion through my lips and my arm the knees about who bowed but in my stirrups bend like his that hath received an alm i will not do lest i secrease my honors i lest i secrease to honor mine own truth and my body's actions Action teach my mind a most inherent baseness. This apology, this like begging to be let to be alive is so against his nature that he would literally feel like he was becoming a different person. Okay, sorry, this is gonna be a little bit messy because I'm just trying to puzzle it out. In at the end of Act Two of Hamlet, Hamlet gives his oh what a rogue and peasant slave am I speech and he has this line which is must like a whore unpack my heart with words which has always stuck out to me as a passage because my english teacher in um ap lit in 11th grade pointed out because of the word whore legitimately a hamlet is comparing the way that he acts to a whore and the way that he acts is by not acting, that he is having trouble reacting properly, a way that he feels is proper to the death of his father, and that he is having trouble even summing, <laughs> summing up the proper emotionality of it. And he can't physically express himself, so he can't take his revenge, and he can't cry. And this is very frustrating to him. And instead, he must give long speeches. So it's actually very different than what Coriolanus is saying. Because we are doing Coriolanus. We're not doing Hamlet. <laughs> um, 
and but but it did strike me as initially the same because it's a very it is a striking line in Hamlet to say the least and he he being Coriolanus at several points uh seems to feel that bending to the needs of the people or doing anything against his nature makes him no better than like a whore and that he is not he's not only not being true to himself but he is able to be bought and sold uh for the smallest of things and that is kind of what i think is happening in this scene he's possessed by some harlot spirit who can be uh, he he does seem to think that his life is <laughs> Not a good enough reason to stop himself from uh, being a dick. Anya says, Let thy mother rather feel thy pride than fear thy stoutness, for I mock at death with as big a heart as thou. Do as thou list, thy valiantness was mine, thou suckest it from me. But oh, thy pride thyself. Saying like she totally is sympathetic to why he feels like he can't apologize, he hasn't done anything wrong but um and that she knows that he's not afraid of death that he is willing to take it but that when he suckled it from her when he was suckling at her teat uh he took all that courage um for his own death she took it she took it he took it right he took it right from her teat um perhaps maybe that's a little much but i i you know he gets he gets it from her but also I think he sucked it right out of her and um but not that prime that one that that's all his father well that's not part of it <laughs> um it's his own pride that won't let him apologize and not her courage or his her warrior spirit that she gave him but at this point I think we can even say that like Volumnia is like damn wish I wasn't so much like I think being brave is the only thing and it will bring you great honor and honor and bravery is all there is tribunals riling up the people for reasons i sympathize with in 3-3 Coriolanus wants to know why they revoked re, uh revoked their vote and Sicinius says pretty vaguely like that Coriolanus is evil his response to be accused of treatism was like well fuck all of you democracy sucks which i think if i was like put into public office and then when I um, was said something stupid, as I am a human being who would certainly say something stupid, I'd be like, maybe democracy was a mistake. And even in this scene, Coriolanus, Coriolanus is unrepentant and angry, so obviously he did go to see the nobles in three tail with at his mother's behest. But he will not he will not apologize. Uh, he shall just simply be angry. And so they're like, well, exile for you then. He's been run out of town, so now he has to say his goodbyes, his blow. His fortunes blows when most struck home, being gentle, wounded, craves, and noble cunning. You were used to load me with precepts that would make invincible the heart that conned them. Mama, you have told me so many things that have given me so much courage. I am thankful for it, etc. I also think it might be Odysseus, and that's probably why I wrote um, Odysseus really big in the margin, and I didn't know why. I don't think it's in the right place. Anyway, I think that there is, like, something going on with the Odyssey in this, but I haven't actually read all of the Odyssey, nor do I am I familiar enough with it and its themes and whatnot to be able to tell you what it is. Very sad for you. So can you and Brutus reflect that now that they have been an enemy of the, royal, of the nobility, they cannot now act um in any way other than like beyond reproach okay cool let's just move on act four scene three a scene between a roman and a volscian it's expository but the volscians understand the precariousness of uh, precariousness of the situation in rome um with coriolanus ba banished the nobles are likely to take all the power from the people as punishment or for protection one of the young what the young roman says the fittest time to corrupt a man's wife is when she has fallen out with her husband and this is in relationship to aphidius and rome he wants to entice coriolanus now but uh coriolanus is not the prize i guess i think rome is the prize uh so it was coriolanus in this metaphor i don't know if, like metaphors about sleeping with women that you're not supposed to be sleeping with like she's a prize to be won or 
Awesome. Anyway, I think uh, I think Coriolanus is the prize. I think Coriolanus is the wife, but I also Rome is the wife, and you get buddy buddy with the husband, and then you're like, <laughs> whatever. This scene is about a speech about um, Coriolanus being sad that he's been cleaved from Rome. I'm not gonna read it. We're just gonna move on. Act four, scene five. Coriolanus. He is making a video for somatic speech about how he's been wronged, and he's like, if they have accused me of be of treason then i might as well commit treason all i've got left of my time in rome is coriolis so what i should do is join the volsians and become coriolanus from coriolis phidias is willing to accept this clearly as we saw in scene two uh we some people are like maybe since Coriolanus and Martius and Rome are no longer in bed with each other. We can have sex with Coriolanus or Rome. One of those two. The serving class of Ophidius' men of the Volscians uh, kind of are hesitant about this arrangement where uh, Coriolanus is going to be in charge of their army. Why is he so made on here within as if he were son and heir to Mars? Because he is, his name is Martius. Set at upper end of the table, no question asked by asked him by any of our senators, but they stand bald before him. Take off the hat as a sign of respect. There he is at the head of the table. They're like, why don't we ask him like what his intentions are? Is he here to infiltrate our place of rest and peace so that he can kill us all in our sleep? <laughs> our general himself makes a mistress of him sanctifies himself with his hand and turns up the white of the eye the bottom of the news is our general is cut in the middle i love this part but one half of what he was yesterday for the other half has half by the entreaty and grant of the whole table coriolanus's arrival in this city in uh, with uh, phidias has uh clearly made Avidius half the man seem half the man that he was before probably because I think Coriolanus is gaining garnering a lot of attention he is devoting himself to Coriolanus's plan uh I think that maybe maybe I know that Phidias has some other plans act four scene six I'm just moving on Rome gets word of the Volscian attack which is what is Coriolanus is doing with the Volscians he is going to attack them everyone believes that they are going to attack and they believe that Rome is vulnerable because they do not have their beautiful marshes to defend them anymore. And also, he might be have teamed up with them. He might have done that. He is a real traitor now. Now he has officially committed treason. <laughs> Cominius says, he is their god. He leads them like a thing made of stone, some other deity than nature that shapes man better. And they follow him against us brats with no less confidence then boys peruse pursuing some summer butterflies or butchers killing flies. The people deserve such pity of him as the wolf does the shepherds. Loved him, says Men Menenius, but like beasts and cowardly nobles gave way unto your dusters who did not, did hoot him out of the city. And so the citizens, now fearing for their lives, recant their recantation. Are you allowed to just keep changing who you voted for? No, make a decision and stick to it. Avidius has second thoughts about Martius, mostly because of um, his own pride, but uh, Martius is, of course, a fearsome weapons. He says, all places yields to him ere he sits down. And the nobility of Rome are his. The senators and patricians love him too. The tribunes are no soldiers, and their people will be as rash in the reply repeals as hasty to expel him thence. Obviously, Aphidius wants to use um, Coriolanus to get Rome for himself, and Coriolanus kind of, I think he must know that, like, he's not going to come out on top of this, but he just kind of wants to get revenge. We're just going right into Act 5. Let's go. So, they're scared. The Romans, they're scared. They're like, this does not bode well for us. Uh, he, the, we are facing a man who took down one city single-handedly and now we do not even have a bad man to help defend us uh-oh Cominius is gone to see him they are old war buddy like little salmon to me because he has re he has this desire to remake himself and to become 
something that is completely detached from all of his pursuits of Rome, and he can't continue to be Coriolanus while he is fighting with the people who destruction gave him that name. Menenius says he is going to try to talk to Coriolanus anyway, um, even though it hasn't been working out. People are trying to talk to him and be like, please don't kill us. And they're like, well, you shouldn't have accused me of treason before I committed treason. What you get is me committing treason. And and so maybe Coriolanus does regret that he has decided to commit real treason this time, but it is his, his pride is too great. Other child, I know not. This is when he receives Menenius, who has come to talk him out of killing everyone. And so Coriolanus says, Wife, mother, child, I know not. My affairs are servant to the others, though I owe my revenge properly. My remission lies in Volscian breasts. One of the things that I just noticed is like Coriolanus has been, has he has spent his whole life devoted to Rome and uh, and he was cut free from Rome. And so he went the only place he knew and they were even people. And it was his mortal enemy of Phidias's army. And he was like, well, now I am going to spend my entire life devoted to Aphidius's army, to the Volscians, and I will just do whatever they need me to do. And part of the good thing about it is that it involves me getting my revenge. Like, I'm just, I'm just a guy. Out for revenge, contract killing my own people. Coriolanus regrets his course, we can see in 5-3, but he cannot deviate from it now. It would be treason, but this time for real, but for from a different person. Um, Aphidius says, uh, is talking about the arrangement that they made so that Coriolanus could still talk to his own people, like receive guests and whatnot. Aphidius says, only their ends you have respected, speaking of like the nobles, the Volscian nobles, stopped your ears against the general suit of Rome, never admitted a private whisper, no, not such friends that thought of them sure of you. And then Virgilia enters, and Volumnia enters, and young Martius enters. And Coriolanus says, let it be virtuous to be obstinate. I'll never be such a gosling to obey. Instinct, and as if a man were author of himself and knew no kin, he is denying his nature like his mother, who is going to bow to him in this scene. And he is not author to himself. He admits that he sees his mother and sees that she is the mold of him. I think he calls her that. And they, oh my God, I love this scene. This is so good. My wife comes foremost, and then the honored mold, then the honored mold, wherein this trunk was framed, and in her hand the grandchild to her blood, but out affection, all bond and privilege of nature break. Let it be virtuous to be obstinate. What is the curtsy worth? Also, obstinate has a very particular connotation, and it's like stubbornness beyond reason. <laughs> It's not a virtue when you know you're wrong. Like stubbornness is just like thinking you're right and doing things because you think you're right. But obstinance is like when you like know you're wrong. What is that curtsy worth? Or those dove eyes which can make gods forsworn. I melt, I am not of stronger earth than others. My young boy hath an aspect of inter intercession which great nature cries, deny not the vultures plow Roman harrow Italy. I'll never be a gosling to obey instinct, but stand as if a man were author of himself and knew no other kin. Volumnia gives like a great big speech and Coriolanus is being obstinate. He's not going to. And Volumnia gives an even bigger speech. And she says, making the mother, wife and child to see the son, the husband, the father, tearing his country's bowels out and to Poor we thine en enmities most capital, thou bearest us our prayers to the gods, which is a comfort that all but we enjoy. For how can we, alas, how can we for our country pray, where two we are bound together with thy victory? Alack, or we must lose the country, our dear nurse, or else thy person or comfort in the country. We must find an evident calamity, though we had our wish which side should win, for either thou must as a foreigner recreant, foreign recreant be led with manacles through our streets, or else triumphantly tread on thy country's ruin and bear the palm for having bravely shed thy wife and child's blood. For myself, son, I purpose not to wait on fortune till these wars determine, if I cannot persuade thee rather to show a noble grace to both parts than to seek 
the end of one, thou shalt no sooner march to assault thy country than to tread. Trust to it, thou shalt not, on thy mother's womb that brought thee into the world. Coriolanus is still obstinate, <laughs> as he said he would be. Uh, and Virgilia Valenia continues, Nay, go not from us thus. If it were so that our request did tend to save the Romans, thereby to destroy the vultures whom you serve, you might condemn us as poisons, poisonous of your honor, thinking of her honor and his honor and what she taught him. No, our suit is that you reconcile them. While the vultures may say, this mercy we have showed the Romans, this, re this we received, and in either side give all hail to thee, and cried, be blessed for making up this peace. Thou knowest, great son, the end of war is uncertain, but this, un this certain, that if, you that if thou conquer Rome, the benefit which thou shalt thereby reap is such a name whose repetition will be dogged with curses whose chronicle thus writ. The man was noble, but with his last attempt he wiped out, destroyed his country, and his name remains for the ensuing age of horde. Speak to me, son. Thou hast affected the fine strains of honor to imitate the graces of the gods, to tear the thunder, the wide cheeks, the air, and yet to charge thy sulfur with a bolt that should be that should but writhe in oak why dost not why dost not speak thinkst honor it honorable for a noble man still to remember wrongs daughter speak you to virgilia he cares not for your weeping speak thou boy who obviously doesn't <laughs> perhaps thy childishness will move him more than i can our reasons there's no man in the world more bound to his mother yet here he lets me pray like in the stocks thou hast never in thy life showed thy dear mother any courtesy what <laughs> i think that's pretty funny that she's like you never cared about me <laughs> thou hast never in thy life showed thy mother any courtesy when she poor head fond of no second brood had clucked to thee to the wars and safely home loaded with honor Say my requests unjust and spurn me back, but if it be not so, thou art not honest, and the gods will plague thee that thou restrains me from my from me restrains from me the duty which to a mother's part belongs. He turns away. Down, ladies, let us shame him with our knees to his surname Coriolanus longs more pride than pity to our prayers. So we will home to Rome and die among our neighbors. I am hushed until our city be a fire and then I'll speak a little. Because he is like, damn, I guess I will we'll make peace. So um, I think this is a really cool speech for a couple of reasons. Um, the first part of the speech, uh, Valemnia is saying like, we're not happy to see you. We are very sad when you were exiled and we are very sad that you are now making war on our home the old there's nothing good to happen for us either our home is destroyed and we are killed or you are an enemy of the people and she's like it would be bad for you it would be bad for us but it would be bad for you too you want to be honorable you want to make everybody pay you're not <laughs> this isn't gonna work out for you but you can be a hero you can be a hero if you made peace between the Romans and the Volscians, and in some ways he does. Like, it's crazy. Like, I think we'll just skip to the end here. Yeah, we're just gonna skip to five, six. And um, he he does speak. He does, you know, save Rome. And he does, don't know that there are ensuing wars in this Shakespeare universe between the Romans and the Volscians. Um, but, uh, so she's appealing to his sense of honor and to his love for his mother and his wife and his child. And um, she seems to feel like some genuine remorse for her part in making Coriolanus the kind of man that he is. And I think that this could be a really interesting play if I was smart enough to um, understand like all the nuances of like a mother like wanting to take back the influences and the pressure that she <laughs> gave to him so uh but i love those last lines this fellow this fellow not my son this fellow had a vulsion to his mother his wife is in coriolis and his child like him by chance 
I like, it's fucking crazy. I don't know, it's just so great. Okay, five, six. So, um, they're talking like, Rome's gonna fall, and then five, five, they're like, um, Rome is not gonna fall, and they call Volumnia the life of Rome, which I think is so cool. She's the best character in this play. In five, six, we get a Phidias, and he is like, I can't believe Coriolanus did this to us, and also I can't believe we're calling him Coriolanus. Why are we calling him the name that he got for killing our people? First of all, I, he's like, I cannot believe Coriolanus switched play, switched sides. He's never done anything like that before. That is crazy. And also, has he been using me a little bit? I'm gonna use him. So, Coriolanus is now, they're like, well, we'll just, it, we're not gonna take Rome, but we will kill Coriolanus. They're having an argument, like they're having like a public argument, and he calls him Martius and Coriolanus is like, Martius? That's my name. You can't call me Martius. And he says, I, Martius, Caius Martius, dost thou think thou trace thee with that robbery, thy stolen name, Coriolanus and Coriolanus, which is like great, excellent, awesome. They're having like a public argument now. But, you know, the they all kill him. They're like, well, okay, time to die, Coriolanus. And time to die, Martius. And he does. He dies. Goodbye, Martius. Um, he dies. But then the Volscians, they just leave. I think that they just leave Rome. They're just like, well, okay, well. It's always like, the end of this play, I reached, reached the end of this play, like, the first time. Like, after they killed Martius, and I was like, that's it? <laughs> that's all what happened? Like, I don't understand. Like, okay, just so we know the course of events. Martius uh, was in a war, and he fought very bravely, and he got a new name. And then they were like, you should be the president. And then he was like, I don't know. And he was like, yeah, no, you should be the president. And then he was very obnoxious, and so they, they didn't want him to be president anymore. And so they were like, well, what if we just kill him? And they were like, yeah, let's just kill him. And he's like, you can't kill me. I didn't commit a crime. And they were like, N it doesn't matter. We don't want you to be president anymore. We're just going to kill you. And he was like, that, what? And he's like, I'm not going to come to my own trial if you just want to kill me for being obnoxious. It's not a crime to be obnoxious. Uh, after, <laughs> after he has uh, been like, I'm not coming to my own trial. I don't know what I'm being accused of. And until you tell me what I'm actually being accused of, I can't come to my own trial. They just exile him instead. And he's like, I think that's a load of bullshit. And they're like, well, would you rather be dead? He's like, maybe I would rather be dead. And um, then, <laughs> and then um, Marcius uh, goes and he joins the enemy from whom he got his name, well not from whom, because of whom, after he destroyed their city, he was got his name, and they're like buddy buddy for a little bit, but then his mom comes and she's like, why don't we do something different? Like what if we don't destroy Rome and kill me and your mom and your wife and your child, and you did we did something that was very different, which was not doing those things and instead making peace, and he goes, Yeah, like, I think that sounds good. <laughs> and uh, then Avidius is like, what the fuck? I was going to take Rome, not not take Rome. I can't believe he had a change of heart. He's never had a change of heart before. I don't know what happened. And then Avidius uh, is like, well, I'll kill him. And then he did. He killed him. So I think the best reading of this play would be if they did sack Rome. Uh, because... Uh, then everybody gets their comeuppance, and nobody gets out alive, and nobody deserves to get out of alive, uh, because everybody is bad. <laughs> I love this play. So good. Um, I hope you liked this video, and that's it. I'll see you with another one very soon. I don't know what kind of video it'll be, but it will be one. It will be one. I'll, I'm coming back. I promise. All right, bye.